was one of violent labor troubles and strikes. San Francisco's general strike gripped the city in a death-like clutch. A gasoline shortage stopped almost every wheel in town. Everyone walked or stayed at home. Serious clashes claimed many victims. Business was paralyzed and hunger threatened the city. While an auto accessory worker strike in Toledo, state guardsmen had to resort to tear gas, lead and cold steel to curb the temper of the strikers. Spurred by radical agitators, tear gas and knockout gas in a stifling barrage, which turned the Ohio City streets into an amazing scene of conflict. In Minneapolis, a truck driver's strike was climaxed by severe riots and fights between the strikers and the police with many casualties. Warfare in the streets, civic strife at its worst. From the waterfronts of the west to the textile mills of the east, the year 1934 erupted in massive strikes. Among them, one stood out as particularly decisive. Long and bloody, fought for stakes of life and death, it transformed the city and inspired working people across the country. We were just trying to get a living wage for our families because we were really underpaid at the time. So the truckers all went out on strike. Those were not strikes, they were civil wars. There were tremendous violence in them, and the uh, impact of it was that the employers were not going to be the masters of the workplace. And that was really what it was all about. It is we who plow the prairies, but the cities where they trade, dug the mines and built the workshops, endless miles of railroad lay. Now we stand outcast and starving, May the wonders we have made, but the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever, solidarity forever, solidarity forever, for the union makes us strong. Minneapolis, Minnesota, 1929. A pleasant city of lakes and parks, the vibrant commercial hub of an agricultural empire. It has prospered in the 20s. Business and civic leaders are certain that even better times lie just ahead. And yet, all is not well in the city of lakes, for Minneapolis is a city sharply divided. On the one hand, the employers, with their fine homes overlooking the western lakes. On the other, an almost totally non-unionized workforce whose wages are among the lowest in the nation. To prevent unionization, the employers bank on the Citizens Alliance, originally composed of small and middle-sized businesses, now the representative of the largest employers as well, the Alliance combats union organizing by means of the stick and the carrot. They used labor spies, infiltrating labor organizations. They used uh, strong arm methods, physical force, uh, but then in, on the other hand, they also used uh, what they called the free employment service. That is to say, they would uh, uh, enable people who wanted jobs to get jobs without paying any fee to some kind of cutthroat employment agency. Few businesses dare break the solidarity of the alliance to negotiate with labor. Those who do find themselves denied loans by the banks which form the backbone of the organization. Since the end of World War I, the Citizens Alliance has enjoyed almost total power. Wages, which rose 11% nationally during the 20s, have risen only 2% in Minneapolis. Once I built the railroad, made it run, made it race against time. Once I built the railroad, now it's done. Despair, 1930. The American economy stops dead in its tracks, shakes with sudden convulsions, and rattles slowly backwards. Banks close their doors, and businesses collapse. A vast army of hollow-faced men and women, without work or hope of income, roam the streets, sleep on benches, and beg for bread. In 1932, a new president, Franklin Roosevelt, 
promises government intervention to stimulate the economy. In the short space of these few months, I am convinced that at least four million have been given employment. Or saying it another way, 40% of those seeking work have found it. That does not mean, my friends, that I am satisfied or that you are satisfied that our work is ended. We have a long way to go, but we are on the way. 1933. Congress passes an economic planning measure, the National Recovery Act. The NRA, though limited in scope, encourages public confidence. At least someone is doing something. Business conditions improve. Unemployment declines modestly, but wages fail to keep pace with rising prices. And in Minneapolis, workers have scarcely been affected. People were desperate. Uh, people were starving. People were on half rations. Uh, uh, well, like... Uh, I had a very menial job. I did a little shipping and receiving for the company I worked for and did their local loop deliveries. And I received $16 a week for 44 hours work. My brother drove a truck for Hall Supply Company, a bicycle concern. And he worked 54 hours a week, uh, nine hours a day, six days a week, for $15 a week. And there were a lot of men uh, trying to raise families on $15 a week, and some even less. Uh, conditions were terrible. Attempts at organizing and strikes by small craft unions are frequent in Minneapolis during 1933, but they meet with little success. Then, a crack opens in the employer's fortress in February of 1934. Local 574 of the Teamsters Union organizes poorly paid workers in the Minneapolis coal yards. Well, in those days, the, um, the people who lived, they didn't have no furnace heat. They had stove heat. And when they ordered coal, the coal had to be carried up to the second, third floor. And the, coal the helpers from the coal yards were sent out, and they paid them 35 cents a ton of coal to carry, them a, flight of, carry a ton of flight of stairs. When the employers flatly reject the coal workers' demands for better wages, the union votes to strike. Employing militant tactics to stop the delivery of coal throughout the city, the strikers catch the Citizens' Alliance off guard. After two days without coal, the employers relent. Behind the scenes of this first successful strike in Minneapolis in many years lies a conflict on the other side of the world. In Russia, two leaders of the Soviet Revolution have contested bitterly over the course of their country's development. Above the parading troops stands the victorious Joseph Stalin. Exiled in defeat, his opponent, Leon Trotsky. Supporters of Trotsky have emerged as leaders of the Minneapolis coal drivers. Vincent Dunn, a Minnesota-born Irishman, and Swedish immigrant Carl Skoglund have been expelled from the American Communist Party whose allegiance is to Stalin. The Trotskyists, as Dunn, Skoglund, and their followers in Minneapolis have come to be known, are few in numbers, but skilled and effective organizers. Flushed by their victory in the coal yards, they formulate even more ambitious plans. Carl Skoglund, who I consider to be the master strategist, had laid out a plan to organize the Teamsters Union on an industrial basis rather than on a craft basis where just the driver was involved. And that meant taking in the drivers, the helpers, the warehousemen, anyone connected with the delivery or packaging or warehousing of uh, cargo. Organizing teams begin signing up hundreds of other truckers. The strike leaders plan a mass meeting for the 15th of April to publicize their aims. Scheduled to speak at the meeting is Floyd Olson, governor of Minnesota and leader of the Farmer Labor Party, which has united angry farmers with urban workers around a program of radical reform. By the end of the meeting, the union has over 3,000 members. The workers approve wage, hour, and working condition demands and vote to strike 
if the demands are rejected. Attacking its socialist leadership, the Alliance refuses to recognize the Union as a bargaining agent for the workers. The leadership of 574 believes a major strike will move other poor and working people to militant action. But 30,000 Minneapolis workers are without jobs. Their demands for public relief have been met by clubs. They are desperate, a potential army of strike breakers. Aware of this, the Trotskyists persuade Teamster Local 574 to commit the union to the fight for public relief. The unemployed are invited to form their own section of the union. They sign up to serve as pickets instead of strike breakers. On May 15th, with battle plans carefully mapped out, Local 574 of the Brotherhood of Teamsters votes to shut down Minneapolis. The strike headquarters is an old garage. Carloads of cruising pickets are dispatched from the garage to stop all trucks reported moving. A women's auxiliary of strikers' wives works 12-hour shifts to feed thousands of pickets. And we bought, brought kettles down to make this soup and, we, and boards. All the women furnished these things and their knives and things and cut up this, uh, the vegetables for the soup, which was donated to us. And uh, of course, we didn't have any meat, so it was just a vegetable, you know, just regular vegetable soup made out of different carrots and, and cabbage and everything like that. But the men were m mo most thankful to get this. I worked in wherever they needed me. I worked in the commissary, which was running 24 hours a day. Uh, I worked in the, um, we had a sort of a hospital set up. And we had a young doctor by the name of Korchik that helped in the, in the hospital. And we had some nurses, I think, from General Hospital that came down on their free time and also assisted. Sympathetic small business people provide food for the strike kitchen. Bread, for instance, from some of the bakeries. Uh, Layman's Bakery was very uh, generous. Uh, some of the milk companies sent in milk and gave us tickets so they pickets could take milk home for their children. And we'd get rolls, you know, Danish or something like that from the bakeries. I don't think they were strictly fresh, but they were day old. But they were good, and we used them, and we're glad to get them. Even Governor Olson gives $500. But National Teamster President Dan Tobin publicly opposes the strike. He uh, came out and declared that the strike was a wildcat strike and he wouldn't support it. Never gave the union a dime's worth of help. May 17th. The streets of Minneapolis are virtually empty. Sympathetic citizens like Kent Hatcher, a courier for a paper company, let the picket squads know the whereabouts of moving trucks. I was uh, more or less making deliveries around the loop, uh, and if I would see any merchandise being moved uh, by private car or by small truck, uh, I would call the union headquarters and they would send a few men uh, out to, uh, well, to more or less stop the movement of goods. Secretaries who are sympathetic to the strike listen in to the talk of their employers and give the union information on anti-strike plans. May 18, the Citizens Alliance calls a citizens rally to protest the strike. A law and order committee is appointed to work with city police to stop the picketing. Police arrest dozens of pickets in a sweep of the city. The Citizens Alliance is determined to move trucks and break the strike. Saturday morning, May 19th. Police and hired deputies provide protection for the movement of trucks from the Beerman Fruit Company 
in the market district of Minneapolis. Hundreds of unarmed union pickets and spectators argue with the police and try to keep the trucks from moving. Surrounded, the police use force to break up the crowd. At a given signal, the police started to club us. Well, I don't remember much after that because I got hit on the head pretty bad and more than once, obviously. And when I came to, I was laying in the Beerman fruit house on the floor and Harold Beale and Louis Scullard, both fellows of uh, my squad, were also there and they were bleeding pretty heavy. Bruised and battered, the pickets retreat. Enraged, the strikers spend the next day preparing for violent battle. Aware of these preparations, the Citizens Alliance signs up hundreds of new deputies to strengthen the police. Even some prominent businessmen volunteer. Monday morning, May 21st. Several hundred police and deputies confront a comparable number of pickets at the Gamble Robinson Company in the Market District. As trucks begin to move, the battle flares. Suddenly, hundreds of additional strikers armed with bats appear out of nowhere and charge the police. Fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat ensues and continues for hours. In the midst of the fight is a young Chippewa Indian named Happy Holstein, who has come to Minneapolis from the White Earth Reservation. It, it was slaughter. We, we put about 40 in the hospital that morning of uh, the Minneapolis police. And I think that, uh, to me, that was the, uh, the beginning of a strike. Uh, uh, show the guys that, you know, that they could do it. And the cops showed us how to, how to swing clubs and then the day before, and we learned fast over, who beat them back. And so they shut the gates finally, and you know, we left. Both sides now continue to receive reinforcement. Other Minneapolis unions offer more money and men. The American Legion provides new deputies for the police force. On the morning of May 22nd, two hostile armies meet in the market. As a truck is loaded, the head cracking begins. Police and deputies flee the clubs of the pickets, who soon control the streets. Injured deputies and strikers lie groaning and bleeding on the cobblestones. Two deputies die from the blows they receive. One, C. Arthur Lyman, president of the American Ball Company, is a director of the Citizens Alliance. The battle of deputies run has ended in a rout. A prominent businessman is dead. May 23rd, desperate to restore order, Governor Olson urges Union and Citizens Alliance to negotiate a settlement based on a proposal by the Regional Labor Board. After three days, agreement is reached. The strikers will be unconditionally reinstated on their jobs. A seniority system is established, and employers grant union recognition to a broad range of workers in the industry. On Saturday, May 26th, the jubilant strikers return to work. Structural relations of power have been altered. But the battle for Minneapolis, which now appears settled, has really only begun. Soon disputes arise over the meaning of several clauses in the strike settlement, and again, trouble is brewing. Now, noting that among the leaders of Local 574 are known revolutionaries, the employers charge that the real aim of union demands is to bring communism to Minneapolis. Advertisements in the Minneapolis Journal, Star, and Tribune carry dire warnings of communist plotting. They tried to make it a national issue that this was only the foothold, that they would, uh, you let them get by with it here, you let them it organized, you let these commies get a foothold, and it's just all they need to... Uh, they painted a picture of national revolution and everything else. It was, that's how badly and how feelings ran real high. 
and your papers, uh, they didn't try to, to hold it down a little. They tried to make it <laughs> sound as bad as they possibly could. Upset by what it considers the pro-employer bias of the city's dailies, Local 574 begins its own newspaper, The Organizer. July 6, 1934. Under the slogan, Make Minneapolis a Union Town, several thousand Teamsters and supporters from all the unions in the city parade through downtown and meet at the municipal auditorium. The rally demands that the employers recognize 574 as the bargaining agent for all its members and increase wages or face another strike. The demands are rejected. July 16th, by secret ballot, the union votes to strike and elects a committee to coordinate activities. We had a committee of 100, a strike committee of 100 members and from the rank and file plus the uh, leaders and that we, we met every morning every morning and laid out our plans for the day. How was the committee chosen? There were uh, the committee was chosen uh, what we did we set up our setup was that there was a steward in every organization and the workers in their own plants picked their steward and these they were the committee of a hundred was made up mostly of the stewards that the rank and file himself pick. So decisions were made pretty the decisions, the decisions were made democratically. Again, other Minneapolis unions offer support to the strike. Practically all the unions supported us as much as they possibly could. And during the strike, the um, cooks and culinary workers, uh, uh, International was holding their international meeting here in Minneapolis at the time. And I remember that they were the first union that came to our help when they marched down and gave us a check for $1,000 for the strike benefit. The union establishes a special farmer's market, so small farmers can sell produce directly to the public. In return, the Farm Holiday Association, which has united farmers against bank foreclosures, pledges its solidarity with the strikers. The working farmer supported us those that understood what it was all about. And we were fortunate to be in a state where there was an active farm holiday association. The farmers helped us tremendously. And they used to bring in, they used to bring in food and supplies and milk in every way. And farmers that understand what it's all about realize that they're workers too, except they ain't got no eight to five day. They start in the morning and they quit at night. And it's seven days a week. But the farmers, the farmers around the adjacent area to the Twin Cities were tremendous in their support and help in the 34th Street. July 17th, pickets fan out from new headquarters in the heart of downtown. They keep the streets nearly free of truck movements. We exempted the milk trucks, any, any outfit that was running under union contract, because we weren't striking them. So we exempted them, the milk and ICE, because there was an ICE Wagon Drivers Union Local 221 that had a contract. We let them operate. And the streetcars, and I think the taxi cabs. July 18th, Mayor Bainbridge of Minneapolis urges Governor Olson to mobilize the National Guard in case of new outbreaks of violence. July 19th, Minneapolis Police Chief Michael Johannes orders his men to begin moving goods. The police move a truck without resistance from the Union. Friday, July 20th, 1934. Henry Ness is on picket duty for the Union. He is riding on the back of a pickup with a dozen other strikers when a truck carrying merchandise pulls out from the Slocum Bergen warehouse near the market. The pickup in which Ness is riding moves quickly to intercept the truck. Standing by, a line of policemen are ready with their shotguns. We heard the shooting. It was in the middle of the block. The truck would, would have tried to intercept the truck, I'm sure. That was the intent. But nobody got out of the truck. And you, the pictures will show police started to open fire on it. Harry and I and Ben Kosky, and I remember Ben because we were all three injured, come out of that alley, and we ran into a policeman 
who was down on one knee and he had a sub Thompson machine riot gun. And just as we come around the corner, he fired. And he knocked Harry DeBoer's leg. We didn't know how bad, but Harry fell down. Ben Kosky's hand was right next to Harry's leg and he pretty near severed it. And I got the balance of the charge, the lacerations in the uh, uh, stomach area, and uh, I got some cracked ribs out of it. I thought I was killed because I was bleeding, but it was just surface wounds, it turned out to be. We got Harry, got him up to the strike headquarters, we got Kosky there, and everyone went to different hospitals. At their home, Moe and Rose Hork receive an emergency telephone call urging them to come to headquarters. It was bedlam when we got there. It was, a, it was turmoil. These boys were shot in the back. They were moaning and groaning. The doctor uh, was trying to get to all of them. The nurses were working. And we were flying around getting supplies for them for those that were attending the sick. It was pretty bad that day, very bad. 67 persons wounded by the bullets of the police. Two will die. The first is Henry Ness, 40 years old, the father of four children. Tuesday, July 24th, tens of thousands of strikers and sympathetic citizens line the streets for the funeral of Henry Ness. I was standing on the sidelines watching it go by like the rest of us, most of us was, but there was quite a parade following this procession downtown, and there was people, well, those wall-to-wall people on each side of the street, you know what I mean, for quite a distance down there. But it was a real sad day for the truckers and everybody. But, uh, it was really a large funeral, the largest one I ever saw in my life. Thousands of marchers follow the body of Ness to a North Minneapolis cemetery. As a veteran of World War I, Ness is buried with full military honors. Mixed emotions now swell in the strikers and their families. I was rather frightened every night. I could, didn't know after they had shot these uh, other strikers and that, how he'd come home or if he ever would come home. Uh, I, I was re terrified. Uh, I was thinking of I and the baby being left all alone and um, I didn't know what in the world I would do because I wasn't equipped for any work of any kind, educated in that way. So it was, uh, it was rough having him out there. I'd, I'd wait from the time he went to the strike till the time he got home. Just nothing but a bundle of nerves. And then I'd, I'd listen continually on the radio. Then I'd hear all this.